Hi, guys. I'm John. And I'm Alton. And we brought intern Barb again with us. Hi, guys. And we are actually going to be talking about what is the best management style? Could this work for you at your job as a leader, as a manager? Or maybe it might work on your everyday life. You'll have to find out. Just stay tuned. Also, don't forget, we have the Deciding Factor extras that we've been posting on Thursdays at 6 a.m. So feel free to check those out. And let's get started in this, guys. This is the Deciding Factor. Everyday life issues broken down to help you build your own opinions on the issues that matter most. Coming to you from Austin, Texas, this is The Deciding Factor with your host, Alton Hill and John Herzog. All right, guys, welcome back. This is The Deciding Factor podcast. Uh, I brought Alton and Barb here, but now I'm going to introduce you to the guy below who's going to help us walk through what is the best management style or leadership style, depending on what you want to say. However, his name is Dr. Benjamin Ritter. He is the founder of Live For Yourself Consulting, which is based not only in Chicago, but also here in Austin, Texas, where me and Alton live. He is a leadership, career, and empowerment coach, national speaker, podcaster, author, mentor, and he is passionate about guiding others in finding and creating, sustaining, a career that they love. With over 10 years of experience coaching and a background in organizational leadership, such as myself, and adult learning theory, Dr. Benjamin Ritter understands how to navigate any career path you decide that you want to travel in. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. I am happy that I finally have someone else that knows what I've been taught. <laughs> I hope we just disagree the entire time then. No, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> for the no, record, team, <laughs> for team the record, I'm only a third uh, uh, as good as you because you've got your doctorate. I've got my master's, so I'm, I'm not to your level. Put us together and you have a doc master, which sounds like a really great new product for COVID times that we can install on our computers and work remotely successfully. So I think we have a, we're great together. I'm down. I like it. You know, me and Barb were talking earlier and the question is because I have my master's, I've thought about getting my doctorate to see if people actually take me more serious. And I feel like my master's degree has done absolutely nothing for me. So does a doctorate really do anything for you? Well, I learned that after getting two master's degrees and no one, caring much about them. And so the doctorate, you know, you think I would, for, I would think of a different story. Like, oh yeah, people are going to believe me when I get my doctorate because they believe me when I got this, these other degrees. <laughs> uh, but actually it's been, it's been really great for at least people opening my emails, I think. And so it's like, it's kind of like a knock on the door and people, you know, they, they look through the people mm -hmm. and they see the credentials. So they open it up with the chain still on and they go, what do you want? And so it is, it has been helpful for that. So it's, it's gotten me access. I think in some places that I wouldn't have gotten access to, especially being in my thirties and working with, you know, leaders and executives and such. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I always wanted just the doctor title. I wish I could just pay for that. And Wait, so you can't. So here's the thing. When, when, I, when I was attending graduations as a kid, I always thought it was nuts that, they they would give doctor doctorates away like they would give these honorary doctorates to these people that have accomplished certain things or something and i was like how do i get one of those and it's actually one of my goals to get an honorary doctorate so you can you can get a free doctorate john all you have to do is convince someone at a university <laughs> to choose you that sounds harder and, than going to no, school you get chances every year this is like and there's a there's a, a ton of universities out there that do this i feel like there's a way to strategize for this I like that. I like or that. you just start writing the word doctor in front of your name, John, and see what happens. Be like, no, really, it's my first name. I feel like doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Name all my kids doctor. Perfect. <laughs> well, Except for that one Supreme Court justice. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do on Zoom is what about just write it in. <laughs> okay. Serious question, though. 
what would you say through all that schooling has been the most valuable, right? I mean, the, the degree in my mind, it's kind of like the trophy, right? But what, what would you say has been the most valuable through that journey, I guess? Yeah. So I'm probably going to answer this a lot longer than you want me to, but and people come up to me and ask all the time, is it worth it going to get your doctorate? Is it worth it going to grad school? Or I want to make a change. So I'm going to go back to school. And I, I say hard stop. Let's actually take a look at all the options that you have in front of you because it's, school is expensive. School doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a job and school can just, you know, is it really going to be the difference to you getting onto this career path? And so I made the mistake when I was getting my joint master's degree and even in undergrad where I didn't invest in my relationships. I didn't invest in the content. I didn't really get anything out of those programs in terms of like, other than the, the degree that was worth it. And so when I went to go back to get my doctorate, uh, I made a, a very, very strong commitment to, I'm going to invest as much as possible to getting something out of this degree, especially because I was paying this one completely out of pocket. Mm. And, and so I invested in my relationships. I built, I built some pretty strong relationships that have been helpful to this day. But the number one thing that I, that I was able to, I guess, take away from this program was actually content. And what's been, what's great about getting a doctorate is that it forces you to basically read academic journals <laughs> and become an expert in a specific field because then you have to get published in it. So I'd say the hours upon hours that I spent becoming an expert in organizational leadership and job satisfaction in motiv you know, motivation, that, that itself is priceless. Cause I don't think I would have held myself to that level of accountability to sit in front of a computer and read <laughs> journal articles for hours upon hours. And I probably wouldn't have ever tried to publish an article. So that I think is, is really priceless and has been foundational to how I speak on these topics and in my business. Man. So when we start talking about the leadership styles that are out there, I know in when I was getting my master's degree, I had to thoroughly uh, dive into this topic. Here's the problem, though, is there are several out there that have changed it, right? Some will say that there's only three leadership styles. Some say seven. Some That's say crazy. 15. It's ridiculous. Here's, <laughs> here's what I was was taught in that there's seven styles. What, what styles do you have that really are the difference makers and more common? And I honestly, and this is where maybe I'm going left field here. <laughs> I really hate styles. I hate assessments. Interesting. I hate specific structures in that regard because, you know, this whole idea of living for yourself is, I don't care what something tells you you are. I, I care about what you want. And I, I care about what you care about and how that applies within your life. And so in terms of styles, you know, I abide by just a humanistic style of leadership. It's not really an official style. It's just what actually works for motivating others. It's not, and you can't force anyone to do anything, but you can create an environment around each individual employee, if you get to know them, that is more likely to motivate them. That's more likely to build trust. That's more likely to increase productivity and achieve the outcomes that you want through the organization itself. So it might not be what you were looking for, but it's, it's more so about connecting with individuals and then creating an environment around that individual that promotes what they need from their work. So, so you don't break it down into any of the seven styles. You style it to just that, that person's personality. Is that what you're saying? And so I created a framework called the team model of managing to motivate. And so basically what it, what it instructs leaders to do is to focus on building trust with their employees. And there's ways to build trust. It focuses on, understanding what environment motivates. So in terms of social relationships within the department, who gets along, who doesn't get along? What are some issues with clients and customers? How can you engage your employees or the employee to solve those for themselves so they can be creative and also feel like they're making an impact and then recognize them for that? What is the work that your employees are doing? So the actual work that they're doing, what do they like to do? What don't they like to do? And how can you help craft that work to be more aligned with that individual employee or your employees? And then what meaning do they derive from the work itself? Or what meaning do they perceive the organization as creating in the world? And really highlighting that on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis 
um, so that they can connect to it. And so this, if you keep these, these pillars, this team model, T-E-A-M, in front of you on a daily basis as a leader, and you include that in your conversations, you're going to get all the information that you need to connect with your employees and to ensure that the, the work they're doing, the environment they're in, the relationships that they have, and it really aligns to them, inspires them, and is more likely, even on a bad day, to still ensure that they're engaged. So can I ask for like a real world example? Let's, let's assume that I'm not in HR or business. Can, is that okay? Assume or, or just yeah. know? Yeah, let's just know that I'm not in HR and that, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so, so basically... what if, uh, yeah, what if I, I run, you know, Bob's hot dog stand and I have three employees? Tell me what this looks like. What, what would this look like if I was doing this successfully? Mm -hmm. So, trust has a, a variety of different components, but let's just take communication, for example. So, if all you're doing is delegating work and telling your employees what they're doing wrong, they're going to have this expectation from you that anytime you approach them to have a conversation, it's going to be negative or going to be work. So that does not build trust. So you have to alter your communication style to also include getting to know them, get small talk, talking about yourself, help, you know, asking them questions, engaging them about what thoughts they might have about the business on problem solving. It can be about recognition. So right there in itself, creating a foundation of communication that builds trust. So once you have trust with your employees, you also then can get the information you need for the other pillars. So for example, how, how do you like Joe during the work? Do you guys get along? Are there any issues? So you're meeting with them and asking them about the social relationships they have at work themselves. Oh, any problems today with customers? Anything where you see an opportunity where we can increase sales or improve the product? So you're engaging them in terms of their clients and the interactions there to ensure that the environment they work in is aligned with what they need. But also, do you have enough buns? Do you have enough ketchup? Do you need something to stand on? So, you know, are your feet okay? Are your knees okay? It's ensuring that the environment itself also is, is, is what they need. You know, if they need pens, if they need receipt paper, if they need a new square to swipe credit cards, like you need to know that and they might not be open to sharing that without you prompting them. So then the actual work itself, you know, do you like working the, the mornings, the afternoons, the evenings? Where do you really, what works for you? Where do you feel most energized and engaged? You know, what's going on at home is to ensure that the work, the work hours actually fit what they need for themselves. And it, I, it's hard to actually craft the work when you're at a hot dog stand. You can ask them if they want to have different menu items and such, but this is that's a little, little bit more applicable to like the internal, you know, corporate America or at home business kind of that, that type of work, less the food service type of work. But there are ways that you can say, okay, if you really don't like scooping onions on hot dogs, how many onion hot dogs do we sell? You know, if it's not that significant, maybe we get rid of the onions. Great. Okay. So you don't have to touch onions all day and smell like onions. And then the meeting of their work, maybe it's having them actually conduct, you know, well, it depends what they care about. If they're just working to get money and bring it home, then you have to really connect with them about their home life and really maybe give them a financial bonus or give them something if it's for their kids, tickets for a ball game for their kids or something like that for, for meaning. But if they actually really do like making hot dogs and maybe they like the culinary aspect of it, then help them create new menu items. Or maybe they, they really like the connection and the personal aspect of it. So ensure that you're not pressuring them for sales. You're actually telling them to focus on the customer satisfaction or providing customer satisfaction survey results to them or having giving them time and paying them to go out there and actually interview past customers and things like that. So what you're doing is you're crafting the individual job to the individual employee based on what they need and what they think fulfills them. Does that give a little bit more context? It does actually. That helps me a lot. And it, it's got me, I want Alton to speak to this because well, he's the small business guy. So tell me, how, how does this strike you? He's big business now. He grew over. First, I, I hate to do this, Ben, but I got to call you out because you said you didn't really like assessments. But based on what you just said, I feel like you're constantly assessing, right? Like, you're communicating with people and asking and receiving daily, like something about them, right? I mean, is that is that right? A hundred percent. And I think the difference that I that I define in terms of an assessment, because <laughs> it's just my my opinion, is that an assessment fits you in a box, and mm -hmm. then that box is what you use to describe who you are, and it, that box becomes a crutch towards evolving and changing. And that assessment then also hides the fact that you're an ever-evolving human being 
that has different needs and wants and desires and personalities based on the day and also what you're going through. Yeah. So like, basically you're talking about the, I'm a red, I'm an A, I'm a, those types of assessments, mm, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I think what you're saying, I'm, I'm really hearing well, I want to know, do you have children? Other than a dog and a cat. I, I know you that. have a dog and a cat, but this whole time I'm sitting here because I've had em employees that are working under me, but I was thinking the exact same thing as a parent because I hope nobody's listening. Like, I feel like in the business world, like, it's okay. I feel like I'm all right. But some days with the kids, I'm sitting here going like, I give up, you know, but I think like what you're saying, it's like, look, if, if dad comes and yells at you and that's the only thing that you hear from dad, it's like, why didn't you pick up your room? Go take a bath. Hey, don't drop that on the floor. Right. Then it's kind of a similar thing when maybe, maybe dad's moms could come up and be like, so you don't really like this homeschool thing. What would you do differently? <laughs> you know, like give them that opportunity to at least not take the, the brow beating of why didn't you make your bed, et cetera. But, but what you just did was in still two different leadership styles. You had the dictatorship and then you had the democratic, right? I don't know what you're saying, John. Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking down at Ben to see. Yeah, I just live here. Yeah. So, yeah, so I... let's, let's break it down then. Let's do the seven styles. That way everybody else knows what those styles are. So they have some idea of um, this conversation and how, they play a different part. So, um, you know, there's authoritarian. Yeah. Point out the one where I threaten the rear naked choke. If you don't do it, <laughs> I need to know that one. Taking notes here. So that's a authoritarian, which is, uh, yeah. like dictatorship, right, Ben? Very much so. Yeah. So do what I tell you now. Uh, Got it. A great example of that would have been, uh, what was it? Bill Gates, uh, when he started up Microsoft, right? Because it was really, you know, do this, do this, do this. And it worked. It's, it's a combination, right, of the authoritarian and the autocratic. And, but yeah, they're, they're very similar. And it's follow me. I, I, I know what's right. I have the vision. I am also the boss. Right. Uh, there's visionary, which is, uh, you know, uh, kind of like, come, come with me. I know the path. Let's do this together. Uh, affiliative which is, um, you know, you're, you're putting your group's feelings and emotions into it, really caring, right? And then there's coaching, which is another common one, which I, I tend to personally do myself, um, just kind of walking them through, here's how we do things. Uh, let's get bigger and better. Uh, then you have pace setting, which is uh, like Mark Zuckerberg, right? He is, uh, I'm going to show you, this is how it's done and repeat, re-rinse, all that. Then there's democratic where, what do you think about what we're doing? Can we make any changes? And then there's laissez-faire, which is, uh, translates to let do, right? And that one, um, I always struggle with that one, but that's uh, pretty much everybody can do whatever the heck they want. Is that, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I mean, also- The manager stays out of it. Yeah, one of the issues too is that I think that if you ever look up leadership styles, you're going to get a plethora of different lists yeah. and and terms and terminology, but the the main concepts are the same. And it's interesting that they've broken it down into the specific styles because they are very much authoritarian dictators, very much transactional leaders, very much visionary leaders, very much late, you know laissez-faire leadership uh, types of leaders. But I, I, it's just, we're so dynamic, much, much, much more dynamic than that. It's. Yeah. I mean, you can be, but when you start studying those particular styles, it's like you realize that when you're in the work environment, because I and HR have had to steer people different ways based on your organization, where you're at. Right. Cause that all plays effect when, when and where that works. Um, the atmosphere of the company matters. Uh, the la laissez-faire, I, I, you know, I don't think I've ever seen it 
that relaxed. I, I can't think of a company off the top of my head that I've seen do that. What I've been noticing, at least in organizations now, is, is that hiring managers are screening for emotional intelligence. And it's very hard to be stuck into one leadership style and type when you have a high level of, of emotional and, and emotional intelligence is just an awareness of other, of, of other, what other people are feeling, what you're feeling and the ability to manage both to manage your own emotions and manage other people in a way. And so it's, that's where I, that, that's why I'm, I have a hard, it's almost like a, I'm hesitating, right. To diving into this discussion of the separate styles. Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw it to you and let you <laughs> grow it and pour, like almost like pour some water on the little spongy creature that, you know, those things that grow <laughs> I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I get it. Cause when you started, you were diving in deep, you know, Oh, you don't like onions. Well, you, you know, I, I'd like to take them out of the menu to avoid you from stinking, but I don't like, care. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's authoritarian leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask here though, right? Because I would agree that, um, I, at least speaking from my past with bosses, um, we can maybe fall in to a rut of at least most of the time we have a specific style and, um, and, but Ben, tell me if like in your, in your consulting business and, and your philosophy here, like, what is it that you're trying to teach people? Like, do you come in and kind of see Alton as like, Oh, look at you, you're a dictator, you know, and then try to like get me out of that because you're looking down on that dictatorship leader style, or are you going to tell me, look, dude, you can still be a dictator, but if you're going to be a dictator, this is how you're going to be the most efficient dictator. Like what's your idea around all of that, I guess. This whole concept, again, going back to live for yourself is some companies need dictators <laughs> and some employees, some employees like dictatorships hmm. and maybe not even companies, but some moments in time require a leader to say, this is what you need to do right now. Instead of what do you guys think we should do right now? Mm. Like those are like, there's just a time and a place for different styles of leadership, which is when I think they become important. And then also in certain types of employees like different styles of leadership. Like if you've worked with the, uh, I have a hard time saying la lazy, I don't even I've never said this word. Laissez-faire. Laissez-faire. Oh. Laissez-faire. Uh, yeah. So that only during He's the Texan. doctoral program. He's uh, Texan. If you're used to that, <laughs> if you're used to that type of leader and you go in and all of a sudden now you have a micromanager and someone that wants to meet every week and do check-ins and one-on-ones and stuff, you're going to be like, whoa, what is going on? So in with all that in mind, I think that's important to be aware of what are you used to? What leadership mm -hmm. styles are you used to? What leadership styles might be best fit for getting to our outcomes, but not even leadership styles. What type, like, what do we need to get to this outcome that we want? You know, is it a brainstorming session? Is it, is it busting out your project management skills or is it, this is what you need to do right now. We're in crisis mode. And so again, it's like pulling away from this idea of style. And so when I go in as a, a leadership consultant, and I'm working one-on-one -on -one or I'm working with teams, the main thing that I try to get across is really personal empowerment and accountability. So really ensuring that every single person understands that they are the person that makes decisions for themselves. And it doesn't matter what, who or what your leader is, you always are the person making those decisions. You are always the person feeling those feelings and you have the choice and in whatever happens. And so ensuring that each individual person understands that their levels of job satisfaction at work are really solely dependent on the, on what they control, the actual work they do, the social context of their work, the meaning they perceive behind their work, et cetera. Uh, but then work, when I work with leaders, it's helping their employees feel empowered because if you have empowered employees, you're more likely to actually get them to be engaged and more productive, but then ensuring that that leader and those employees understand what the goals are of the organization, what the goals are for themselves professionally, and what the goals are of the team themselves. And so when I, when I go in, it's not judging. It's not, it's not, I'm not the dictator. I'm trying to understand what they want to achieve and then trying to see what's the best way to actually achieve that through leadership, through personal empowerment within the teams themselves and the individual employees. Now, I was doing some research before the show. I, I found some shocking numbers. 
Uh, it looks like 77% of organizations have reported that they're currently experiencing a, uh, like a leadership gap or having issues finding leaders that are good and actually have the training necessary for it. Have you seen some of those issues out in the workforce? One of the biggest issues that I see are people that excel at their job. And so companies think they will excel as leaders, but they don't provide any specific training for them. So then not only are they not trained to be leaders, they more often than not don't believe in themselves to be leaders. Mm. So now you have an underconfident leader who also isn't great at leading people, which then everyone gets impacted. The leader feels stuck. The leader feels underutilized. The leader feels underconfident. The leader is their greatest inner critic. And then their staff, that anything that happens in leadership dwindles down. The staff starts feeling the same way. They yeah. feel that there's ambiguity. They don't feel clarity. They don't feel engaged. They don't feel like they have proper leadership. Etc. So I wonder if the training is inaccurate or if it's just not delivered the right way, because, you know, clearly there's also 83% of organizations that say that it's important to develop leadership at all, all levels of the company. But on top of that, if you look at uh, 2017, globally, uh, companies spent $365 billion on training and education and out of that, the U.S. was $160 billion. So if they're spending that much money on training and development, what's going wrong? They're training on leadership styles. <laughs> 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 this is why my interviews never work out. Um, I, I have some more to add there, but I think, I, I think Barb has a few thoughts. She never has I, thoughts for I sure. I never have thoughts. No. Okay. Here's what I'm wondering. This is, I, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. We'll pull away from the hot dog stand, not a narrow thing. You mentioned before that you had a, a basically a, correct me if I'm wrong, humanistic view of leadership. Is that, am I quoting you right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So it, it almost sounds like for this to succeed, for leadership to be built, for good management, whether we call it style or skills, you need to be hiring the right people. How is is that part of how you're looking at this? Is how do you determine which people are even you know capable of caring about their work this much, bringing meaning to their work, uh, and maybe the same. Maybe I'm asking the same thing if I'm an employee looking for what is the right company for me. It's it almost sounds like this is going to be beating your head against a brick wall unless you are actually the right person for the job. I hope everyone is the right person for the job that they choose to take. And do you think they are though? I hope that people are, you know, they, they choose jobs based on a little bit of introspection. And I think there's, there's an issue there. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Oftentimes that, you know, oftentimes also the interviewers, the hiring managers, and the departments, organizations themselves don't fully describe the position itself or the culture of the organization or the expectations of it. Because, you know, the, the person in the interview wants the job. The organization wants to hire someone for the job, or at least the hiring manager does. So is there enough time spent on assessing for value alignment, describing the job description and duties? And I think there's some work to be done there. But in, in terms of just the, this humanistic style, you don't have to be the right fit for the job. You just have to be aware enough of yourself, the things you like from work, the impact you wanna make within the organization and the work itself, the career path you wanna go down, what professional growth that you desire. And of course, you know, the people you enjoy working with, or you have to have at least some semblance of respect for humans, or you have to be like a good, I wouldn't, I don't want to use the word good human because it's such so broad, but I mean, if you are a person that is interested in being happy at work, you're, you're, uh, this will work for you. And I think a lot of people are like that because then the, it's the leader's job to go in and say, how do we make this work work for you? Not how do we make you work for the work? And that often doesn't happen. Often it's very, hey, this is what you need to do. This is the report you need to do. This is how you need to do it. So Which I guess I'm wondering if, yeah. if you're a leader, uh, what if you have an employee that does not have that desire to love their work? Where it's like, it's a J-O-B. I have, you know, I'm 
selling hot dogs and I did not knocking hot dog salesmen at all. But um, that's my curiosity is if a leader in a company, an entrepreneur gets involved in uh, what you've written about here, if they, if they buy in, they're like, okay, will it work for every employee or is there a point and do you help them find that point where it's like, and you're done, we are not a good fit. And and John, I'm not sure if you have something to add here, but there's some really good work done by the Studer Group, which is they focus mainly on healthcare organizations and they classify employees as low, middle and high performers. And that I think that classification classification is great because it actually helps the leaders understand where to spend their time. And there's a certain amount of time you can spend on low performers, but there's a that's a cutoff point as well to say these employees need to go. And you really should be spending your time on the middle of performers that because they have, if they improve to high performers, like, wow, like they're already good. They can be great. So getting those middle performers to be really engaged with their work is really important. And then also targeting the high performers because they're usually most at risk to leave an organization <laughs> and an employee that is really excelling. They know that they're excelling. They know that they're good. They know that they have they they have a path in front of them. And so if they aren't engaged, if they don't feel that the path is at the organization, they're going to leave. So that that's where you need to focus as a leader. But I'd also say, because I've done a couple, a couple different corporate workshops for the government, and the government is known for having long term employees that get very comfortable with their work. And there was a lot of senior leaders that had negativity, like stories of negativity for their employees. And I'd say if, if you're a leader that says, well, I just, this person doesn't care, I'd say, okay, someone has to trust for, first. You need to go into work and you need to drop all this resentment and judgment you have towards this person. And you need to start from square one and because that person that isn't engaged with their work, they have a story themselves. Mm -hmm. They have a story about you. They have a story about the organization. They have a story about work. And so how do you start building trust and start figuring out what's meaningful to them? What connects with them? Like why they're even still coming into work and, you know, with this attitude, where does this stem from? And it's going to take time. It's going to take time. And I say, do that before writing them off completely. You know, what's funny is you, you did dip into the succession planning when talking about uh, the lower, lower guys, the middle level and the upper. Uh, what's funny is, is I've talked with people over at Google and they actually talk about the lower 10% of people that really just don't do anything. Exactly. They cut them off. So every year, the lower 10%, you're done. We don't need you. We need to replace you and start looking for something different. Do you agree with that type of a leadership and mentality? <laughs> it's, the, it's the culture of the organization. Okay. There. And that is whatever positive attributes that is brought to them or negative consequences. I think they've, they've accepted it and they find that it's more valuable for them. I'm not sure how to directly comment on it. Like, is that the right thing to do? You're sure going to get people trying not to be in the bottom 10%. That's for sure. Uh, but then what, what sort of exit plan do you have for that bottom 10%? Because if not, that can create some, some pretty large animosity towards your organization. And I don't think that's what they want. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. So I'm pretty sure that their exit, their exit plan, their succession planning, as you mentioned, is, is probably more positive. Like what if you were the bottom 10% and got six months of salary plus unemployment? Okay. That, you know, and then someone's going to hire you because you're from Google. Like, so again, it's, you know, is it like, what are the details there? I'd be curious. Because if it's just you're gone, then I think you're, you're creating some negative attributes to your cult, organizational culture. Yeah, it was just like one of your groups that you're in, Alton, where it's the community and, and owners of small businesses get together and they kind of talk about their business strategies and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was one of those business networking events in, in which we stumbled upon and had conversations. Yeah, I mean, I guess when, when you're that large of an organization, you know, it's a little different than mom and pop, right? But at the, at the same time, I've always heard hire slow and, and fire fast. Um, <laughs> this kind of been what I've heard, but you know, like if you're hiring slow, you're probably doing the things that Ben is saying, right? Like checking out for, um, EQ, seeing if they're a good fit, seeing what motivates them. I can speak from my experience. Um, 
and I don't know anything about these leadership styles, but what I always tried to do was get to know my people and figure out what motivated them and what they were good at and, and try to put that together. Because if someone's happy, well, generally, if we're doing something that we're good at, we're happy, right? Like we just naturally gravitate to things that we're good at because it's easier to do something that we're good at. If we're crappy at it, it's generally not that fun for us. Um, so unless it's jujitsu and you're an addict and have a sickness, but anyway, other than that, um, so I'd find people, you know, okay, well, what do you really like? Or what are you really good at? And, and the people who could produce X widget the best, I'm like, do you want to just produce X widgets and you can kind of mindless and listen to your podcast and just crank it out? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, sweet. You know, so for me, I found just like, I look so much better as a manager, letting people do what they loved because they were incentivized. Yeah, they're good and, and whatever. Um, but and I've even like in my current business, I've kind of moved people, you know, here was your original job. But then I once we started working, I found out that they were actually really good at this. I think originally they were just looking for a job. But then when I finally figured out what they're good at, I'm like, why don't you just do this? <laughs> this is what you're really good at. This is what you like. So do that. But I have two questions for you, Ben. One is um, think fast. Are leaders born or made? You have a consulting firm, so I think I know your well, answer. What was kind of funny about that is that you lagged a little bit right there. So it was like, think fast. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are, are leaders born or they're, made? They're made. They're, they're made. made. They're made. Okay, that's a good answer. In a hot dog stand. That's Well, I, I would say that I think that there are some traits that are good to have already but I think anybody can lead, but this is, I have a question for you and it's a little bit about leading up. And so what I mean by that is I'm a manager, you know, maybe there's a director above me and then I have employees that report to me. Oh man. <laughs> you just, you have to go on. You have when you, whenever you walk into the oh. office, you have to look up. All right. Okay. Well, I'm that's good. Off. What? <laughs> so, and, and, and I want to take this out of the corporate context because I feel like in, in a, sorry, I should have thought about this before I opened my mouth. Let me back up a little bit before I ask my question. Today I was speaking with someone and I was making up my own leadership styles. And uh, are you guys still there? We're yeah, here. You're not still there. I'm frozen. Oh, there you are. Um, and I said, there's like a military leader. Okay. So think of the drill sergeant. He has control over your money, <laughs> your like physical well being, and like, and can peer pressure you. Right. And so to me, that type of leader potentially could be the worst of all because he has, he doesn't have to get any of your buy in. Okay. If I'm a manager, I hired you. I sign your paycheck. I have influence over what you do because I'm writing your check and you love your children. So if you love your children, you're going to do this job or I'll stop paying the check and your kids are going to go hungry or whatever. So I had this like power over you. And then there's other types of, of leaders that might be like a football coach or uh, like I'm in a networking group, you know, and I'm supposed to affect the culture in this networking group. And I have no real, you know, I can't make them do push-ups. I probably shouldn't threaten them with jujitsu. I'm not paying them anything. And so I had a scenario where, um, you know, there's like someone above me who's exercising a particular leadership style that with, let's call it my the people underneath me weren't that big of a fan of and how do you what's your idea there and how you handled it because i'm sitting here going like uh i don't know what to do does that make any sense at all yeah and i want to ping me to talk about the career sweet spot at some point career sweet spot yeah spot. ping me on that but something you said when you were describing leading up was feeling like you are held in shackles by your leader and 
it is very, very hard to work on your levels of job satisfaction at work when you don't feel safe. And so the number one thing I think anyone needs to do initially, if they're in that type of position is to create safety for themselves. And so that means really preparing for the worst because you, you need to feel like you have options. You need to feel like if you lose your position, you're great, you're, you're okay. And that will give you a sense of confidence to be able to ask for the things that you want and to be able to have the conversations that you need because we're, we're missing trust, right? So if we don't have trust. That's not going to, it's not going to work. So instead of trust, we need to create safety for ourselves. So that means document everything in case you lose your position, you know, unemployment is out there. I'm very much a proponent of, Hey, look, you just have a little bit of time to introspect, reflect and get the next best thing is every, every job you every job after a job is usually a better job. So it's, it's nothing to, it's nothing to be scared about. You just have to make sure that you can put food on the table when that's happening. So make sure you're also planning financially, you're saving some money, putting some stuff in the bank, watching what your expenditures are, cutting down expenses, and then fixing the resume and the LinkedIn, the cover letter, starting to network to ensure that you can find an option now so that you can fix where you're at. And that might seem a little strange to go job hunting to fix where you're at, <laughs> but it, it does really help in, in having the hard conversations that you might need to have, or maybe taking what seems like a risk when there isn't trust with leadership. Uh, the next couple of steps are really building fans within your organization. So either with inside, like internally, you can start creating relationships cross-functionally in different departments with maybe even with other leaders to ensure that you're kind of creating a safety net, you're creating your champion group, you're not only just for emotional support, but also for potential jobs and moving into different departments if something doesn't work out with where you're at, or even maybe people that are at his, his or her peer level to be able to have conversations to improve their style of leadership potentially. And then despite the negativity from the leader, if you ever approach someone with a problem, they're going to become defensive. So anything that you are going to prepare to discuss with the leader that you want to lead up with, it needs to be from this mentor type of mentality. So you're approaching them with a question about how to handle a specific situation. And there, there are ways that we can frame this in, in what that question is, but ensure that that's top of mind whenever you're going to communicate with a leader to lead up because they don't like being told what to do. They don't like being brought problems. They like being the leader. That's why they're the leader. Um, Sounds like you're teaching these guys how to be a woman. Like, no, really, it's your idea. I think my husband had the best idea. And here's what it was, right? It's a little true. bit. Hey, if, if women were in power, the world would be a, a safer and better place, right? Well, they yeah, are. that's just not true. Yeah, that's we are already they, in power and look are. at where we're at. Yeah. I'm moving to Iceland. Good. <laughs> hey, I got my that felt random, but okay. I'm, I'm already heading to Vancouver. Yeah, Iceland was, was ranked number number one in terms of female equality and women have changed the government like multiple times over just by protesting in front of the cabinet. Like it's pretty cool if you It feels like a terrible idea. <laughs> like I, I believe that there's a lot of women out there like doing too much work when they don't have to. Seriously, like step back so that the man will do his job. My wife could make me do know. anything she wanted, really. I feel mm -hmm. like if I was a woman, I'd just find me a man and just totally make him do whatever I wanted. That would be my... Yeah. Oh, it's a total power trip, being a woman, thing. in fact. I don't, I don't even know why we bother like protesting and doing all the weird thing with the pink hats and the like, why bother to become president when you can seriously change humanity yeah. from inside your kitchen? Mm. That was, a, sorry, rabbit trail. Back you go. No, that, that was great. I've, I have this all wrong. I should just be working in the inner, inner circles of female leadership and, and housewives. You need housewives. Like, you know, to your, to your point, Barbara, so in this scenario that I'm thinking about, um, I had a woman coaching me on how to do it. And she's like, exactly what you said. <laughs> it's like, Oh, you just got to go in there, you know, give them a compliment and, uh, you know, just ask some questions and that's it, you know? And I'm like, Oh man, is it that easy? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so since we taught you something. Does that mean we qual uh, qualify for a doctorate now? <laughs> Right? No. Way. I'm giving honorary doctorates out tonight <gasps> at uh, at dusk. So be prepared. <laughs> dusk. The bats There's are gonna come. Work. We're gonna be at the bridge where the bats come out. Oh man! And we'll have hoods and those weird sashes that they give out for some reason for doctorates. 
So, so Ben, what did, what did we not ask you? Well, I feel like I didn't answer your question about leading up because I was talking about being safe. So the, the, the last thing that I have to say yeah, is, dude, you totally blew it. is ensure if you, if, so if you don't feel safe, ensure that you're actually you like alter your mindset towards your job itself and, and leverage where you're at no matter what, because I've made this mistake. Clients make this mistake. They become so re- resentful towards a leader and towards their work that they start pulling away from relationships. They really don't start, you know, they start pulling away from work that could potentially build their resume out and, and unique projects and not volunteering for it. And so don't like you have, your job is the greatest asset to career capital you can have. So find ways to leverage it, even if you're unhappy with the leader. So if, once you feel safe in terms of like financial and you have a support system, you can do those things. But then, so leading up, long story, not short, <laughs> leading up, like you said, it's, you have to connect with your leader. And that means you do have to have conversations and ask questions and figure out what they care about, what pressure they're under, because you don't know, what stories they believe, uh, what their goals are for the organization and for the department, and then really try to lead with them, but not as a leader, but through questions and trying to understand and being goal-oriented And then because you are the conduit from that leader to the people below you, you then get a choice on how you want to lead and how you want to speak to them and what sort of structure you want. And sometimes, you know, a drop of poison can spread, but a lot of times you may just have, like, as, as that person in between may have to make the choice that you're just going to have to take a little bit of the poison, try to depersonalize it and then lead in a way that is more proactive and productive, but towards their goals. So that if they end up getting what they want, because they're leading for whatever reason, maybe they're getting pressure, maybe they're fearful of losing their job, maybe that's how they've always led. But if you show them that you're more productive more, and, and you're hitting, the, hitting him where it really matters, then he may start altering his leadership style or give you more autonomy and just kind of mm-hmm. back off. Interesting. So let me ask you this, as far as when it comes to organizational leadership, how do you train and teach uh, the upper level to deal with the fact that, you know, over 90% of millennials nowadays only plan to stay at their job for like three years and then they move on? What do you do? If you have trust and you're having these types of conversations with your employees, you may be surprised in what they bring to you as a leader. And they may even have conversations with you prior to leaving or prior to them even starting to search for you to help navigate that for them. Because look, I have this conversation a lot. It's like, if someone comes up to you and offers you 30% more money in an organization that seems to align with your values at a higher title, and it hits all, it gets the great location and everything, why wouldn't you leave? And so like looking at from that perspective as a leader, okay, if that's the case, then how do we create loyalty? How do we create positive relationships that they don't wanna leave? And how do we also give them the same thing that they would get if they left us? And maybe it's not 30%, maybe it is half that because they get to stay and they don't have to change anything, but it may still also be a professional growth opportunity. And so a lot of companies that I see are actually starting with this kind of gig economy when it comes to work. So they're actually create temporary jobs for their employees and help them move forwards in their career. So it's like, okay, so you want to go be this senior manager somewhere in this type of work. We have that type of work here. We want to give you that position, but we still maybe still, you know, in the, in the transition, do, do half time at your current job and half time at this job or mm-hmm. try this job out for six months and let's see what happens at this pay rate. Gotcha. So you rotate them around, Get, keep them in there. So you mentioned, okay, you said you're in your thirties and that you end up training leaders, I assume that are older than you and you were really diplomatic about it. So I assume that you were like, you know, you train people John's age. And uh, I'm just curious if, (laughs) I'm just (laughs) I'm curious, do you find a difference in your training? Like, are there generational differences um, as to what the go-to approach is? Um, Is there a do, I mean, we make a lot of stereotypes about millennials, Although now that I'm looking at you, you might be one. You might, huh? You're young enough to, wow, that's awkward. Okay. I'm on, uh, anyway, the, I'm on the cusp. You're yeah. on the cusp. We make a lot of, of generalizations. Do you think they're true from a leadership standpoint? Is there something that, ooh, we'll make this positive. Is there something that the millennial generation is instinctively doing better than older generations or vice versa? When did stereotypes become bad? 
When did it that just, happen? It felt impolite after when the millennials and joined the. No, I know. I'm just saying, like everyone is afraid of saying stereotypes, and I don't understand because, like, it's almost always true. Is it not? Is it for the like one percent or ten percent that isn't? Well, Ben's gonna tell us. Yeah, right now. So I want to generalize. You're, you're talking to the guy that doesn't like labels. <laughs> That's a millennial thing, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I think if you go online and search for millennial, you'll find great articles that, you know, praise their attributes and you'll find articles that blame everything on their attributes. So it's in terms of what I tend to see when I work with leaders. Yes. The older generations tend to be, tend to think that this style, this type of leadership that I'm discussing is a little touchy feely and why don't people just work and get their job done <laughs> the problem is is the economy today you know people may not believe this but there are so many more options than ever before on what someone can do to make a living that if you if you say just work they'll say well i can just work everywhere and so now in, Employment really does have to cater to a lot more of the individual than ever before. And it makes sense that millennials who have lived through this understand that a little bit more and are a little bit easier to accept the fact that, you know, it's not, it wasn't ping pong tables and bean bags and it wasn't just doing the work. It's actually, okay, well, you're going to be a stay at home dad for a little bit. Okay. How do we make the work work for you then? How do we ensure that you have those benefits? How do we cater to the family? So do you think at all that the, this millennial mindset has caused this? I mean, I, I'm hearing it. And to me, it sounds a little bit like a problem. Like I think it's the human. I'm mindset. sorry. Okay. I, I think this is how we've all grown as individuals where we have more safety than ever before. We have more options, at least in, you know, in the United States, we have more, we have more options than ever before. We have more, you know, in terms of relationships, look how, how much relationships have evolved, not just for the youth, but for the elderly. Like the, what is it? The, 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 the population sector that is having the most sex out of all of them. Like it's, it's um, no, Which no, the greatest that? increase in STDs is in the elderly because they're having more sex than ever before. And so it's like, it's, it's not just, sorry for bringing that up. Is that okay to say, by the way? <laughs> It's totally okay. And my Actually, mind is what totally I was, blown right now. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. I'm like, well, prepared. what did we think was going to happen when we trapped them all in nursing homes? We haven't let them out for like nine months, you know? So um, I guess that makes sense. So poor example, potentially to use to make my point. But what I'm no, saying ben, is... I want to congratulate you for keeping it together and professional this long in our podcast. So, so, let's give him a hand, guys. He did a great job. I'm bowing. I'm bowing. If we finally got him comfortable. Go ahead. Old people and sex. If you want to check that off your bingo card today, we can look at that. And th he was probably just leading into his uh, career sweet spot <laughs> segment. <laughs> right? Am I right? I'm right. Oh, that's funny. Hey, Barb, by the way, I think it would be like, I, I actually wish, wish for this sometimes. I would love to wake up and not care about how I felt. Like that would be awesome. Yeah, you can do that. It's not bad. Well, <laughs> to not feel like I have to have a greater impact in the world. Yeah. So it's hard. I think it's hard in some sense. It's just how I've grown yeah. up. It's what I've read. And I think a lot of people, it's not, not everyone. I don't even think it's the majority right now. Cause I say the word values and people like, look at me like dumbfounded. So I still think there's a large population out there that, <laughs> that don't, that don't buy into this. Um, but it's, it's out there. It is there. Can it's I... definitely there. I've heard that the that the even the way we buy products now, like we can't just. I mean, there was this whole debate a few months ago between Chick Fil A and some other fast food company. I don't remember. And we we're not allowed just to say like this one makes a better chicken sandwich. I have to believe in them. Like it has That's to be the Lord's a chicken. Whole... You buy it from Chick Fil A. <laughs> I do personally. I buy it from Chick Fil A, but it was a debate, right? Like, and I feel like there's a little part of me that is hearing this and think I think it's valid, and yet. I wonder if I was an employer, if I would be like, you know what? You employee are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like it but, seems ridiculous to have to work this hard to get you to just do your job. But Wait just, a second. Can I, I'm yeah. sure you have a great answer, Ben. This is what I'm talking about. It's like the government has no incentive to be good. Yeah. 
they have it's like we're just going to keep raising your taxes you idiots like it or not if you don't like it we'll put you in jail and that's like in the military they don't have to strive to be an inspiration because they're going to neck chop you if you talk back right and so i feel like used to you know what ben's saying is like there wasn't as many job options right we're coming out of the great depression you got the the uh assembly line it's like do it or not and if you don't like it hit the road but now it's like you don't have to do it so i think what ben is doing is great and that he's trying to help the world's leaders take it up a notch you can't be a crappy leader and still be effective sorry ben go ahead i got up on a tangent there no that that was great that was good and just i think one more point is that you know when we used to go buy anything in the world like for example you go into the car lot you didn't know the price you didn't know how good that car was in terms of safety ratings and so the salesman all he had to do was get you to like the car and he could sell it to you for whatever you wanted and there, there's a huge disruption right now in car dealerships is because people are coming in with all the information they could buy their car online if they wanted. So what is going to make me go buy it from a dealership? It's going to be that relationship. Same thing with organizations. You can get salaries, you can get work culture, you can get reviews, you can go on LinkedIn and talk to people that work there. And so now again, with this idea of options, it's what sells me on this place is, does it fit me as a human being? Does it fit me for my vision? And do I feel like I belong in this area? Because I have a lot of places that I can go check out. Interesting. You got any more to dig in? I want to hear about the career sweet spot, but other than that, I'm good. Tell us about the career sweet spot. Cause I'm thinking okay. about folding my business it... and going and selling Ferraris. So maybe he'll tell me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hinted at it, Elton. That's why I wanted to bring it up. You were talking about finding out what your employees were good at. And by being good at something, you feel good about it. That's very true. And so the career sweet spot is basically an evaluation that anyone can do in their work at any time to figure out if they're in the right job or how they need to adjust their job to be a little bit more satisfied with it. And one of those is, what are you good at? Are you good at what you're doing? Because when, you, when you're good at something, you feel good about it. This is why a lot of times when people get onboarded to an organization, they have a really tough time for the first six months. And so a leader needs to really prepare them for that, but because they don't feel good at what they're doing and they don't know what they're doing. So it's, they, they can feel like, oh, they can be incredibly passionate about it, but feel really horrible about it at the same time because they don't have skills. They don't feel confident. The other area of the career sweet spot is that passion. It's that, what do you find meaningful? Do you feel that your work is meaningful? And if not, you need to reconnect with that or you need to adjust your work in a way that does create some level of meaning within yourself. So you feel motivated and engaged. And the third spot is just, do you feel like, you're on the right path towards work that you want to do next. And do you feel like you're on the right path to, to be able to create those opportunities for yourself? Those opportunities are within the organization potentially, and that you're going to work with people that you might want to work with next. And so if you have, I'm on the right path, I'm, I'm going the right way. You have that level of clarity and you feel good about that. And you feel confident with the work you're doing work that you're great, good at, and you feel passionate about it. That tends to be your career sweet spot. And if any time something is off, let's say you feel stuck, you have to look and see, well, where in, where in those three little areas am I feeling stuck? You know, I'm feeling stressed and frustrated and such. And that, that's been really helpful for people to adjust their current work or to reframe how they see their work to ensure that they're just a little bit happier. Well, I think that there, there's kind of a struggle there. And when I was uh, trying to quit, quit my nine to five, it was like, that was kind of a thing too. It's like, okay, I have this salary here. So at some level, I'm good at this. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm having to decide if I want to check out and, uh, you know, try something different that may be higher on the passion rating, but maybe not as confident <laughs> as whether or not I'm good at it or not. Ah, forget it. Let's just give it a shot. <laughs> well, that's good. It's good to know too, though, because if you know that you're not going to be confident at something, you can at least be aware that it's going to be tough for a little bit. And even just that level of awareness and acknowledgement makes doing something it's a lot easier. Interesting. All right, guys, let's do the deciding factor. You ready? So ready. Now it's time for our deciding factor. All right, Ben, you really screwed me over at the beginning of the show. <laughs> so, so 
Well, the question that we're answering is what is the best leadership style or management style, whatever you want to call it. So knowing what I, I've dealt with in my, my training and then also dealing with uh, people at work, for me, you know, I really think knowing those different styles of leadership are very important, especially if you got to fix something. Because I've been at plenty of companies where it is the uh, autocratic dictatorship style leader that we run into often, especially in some of these small businesses and being able to teach them, Hey, this is what you're doing. We need something different. Here's these other ones. What do you think will fit better for this scenario? Uh, I have seen it work really well. Now <laughs> to your point, I do think that you really can't narrow it down to one of those seven, uh, styles of management that we talked about, you really do have to fluctuate depending on the business goals, where they're at, what stage you've got to look at the people around you uh, being around millennials or old rednecks. I mean, it's going to make a difference. I whoa, mean, whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, or country girls like, like Barb. So it, it really makes a difference on the environment. So, and this is what I always say when I go to an interview is I, I can't tell you of one leadership style that I would do. If anything, it's the coaching act aspect, but even then I can't do that in every situation. So the best leadership style to me is combining all seven of them, which in point is virtually what you said to begin with, even though you didn't want to talk to me about my styles. <laughs> When you said all seven, I was like, and your powers combined. I don't know if anyone, <laughs> does anyone know Captain that? Captain Planet! Planet. Oh. <laughs> Barb's the only one that didn't get that one. Y'all are dorks, come on. I got it. I'm muted. I'm politely laughing in the muted corner here. Oh. Funny right. watching all of you nerd out at once, though. That was funny. Polite is not in one of my uh, mind scan traits, I'm pretty sure. It's on the weak, weakness scale. How, how yeah, risky do you think that was, by the way? Because there's a chance that no one knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Not in this group. There wasn't a chance. No, Wait. no chance. Yeah. Low statistics. Too many millennials here. Or elder <laughs> millennials at that. <laughs> which, which millennium? Yeah. But see, you just went for it with confidence. And I was passionate about it. It's why you're an awesome guest. See? What I wanted to do. I saw it in my future. All right. So, Ben, hit us with your knowledge. Tell us something new. What is the best leadership style? Oh, I thought you were just going to leave it to tell us something new. I was, I was cycling for some Snapple facts. Like, <laughs> we can do that too. If you want to do that, man, it's, I can't say anything more than I think I've already said. It's just the best leadership style is whatever takes into account the people that you're leading and crafts an environment around them that one is, is best fit for them, but also leads you towards the goals that you have as a leader within your department or organization. All right, Barb, what you got? Did you learn anything today? I, I have, this is thought provoking and it seems the thing that keeps coming back to me is communication and expectation because I can't totally get behind uh, there's a lot of feelings. That's a lot of feels. And sometimes I wonder, it's just me theorizing, but I wonder out loud um, if part of the, just the reason <laughs> the millennial workforce has the stereotype that they do is because they have, they're such needy employees. Like I need to feel all these things in order to be happy in my job. And there is a part of me that thinks that is awesome. You need to go find the kind of employer that cares and I think that it's okay to have an employer that wants to lead by, let's go do this. Let's just go do it. You know, and I don't know if that's authoritarian or maybe just expecting that there are people that there is joy in the work because this is how I'm providing for my family. I, you know, like I don't need to, I don't need to feel awesome about it to be able to look at the work itself and say, I value this. Like it's valuable because I have a skill. It's valuable because I bring something to the world. Um, a little, I guess I'm not 195% sold. A, 
a little bit of this sounds like a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work beyond the job. And um, I could see it being worth it if you wanted that kind of employee. But I think you need to hire that kind of employee to start with. Mm. I will say this, I got a little quick story. The, one of the interviews I went to not too long ago. Oh, I hey walked... John, can you hold up? It's almost dusk and I gotta go get my honorary doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> I have my intern preparing them for everybody. <laughs> you have a useful intern. <laughs> so good in a sash, y'all. <laughs> and also, I also have championship belts. Like, yeah, I thought they'd be fitting. Oh, no, no. Adding, adding to that with a story of millennials, I went into an interview as an HR director, and there goes Alton. Uh, <laughs> I to get his belt. <laughs> He probably did. No, he's got a sword. He's going to chop it all in half. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We have Cha lost Championship all. sword. My daughter won it. Nice. Naga, 2017. Anyway. How many fingers did she cut off? Well, none. It was just jujitsu, but they were giving kids swords, which blows my mind. But go ahead, John. <clears throat> he said championship belt. I got millennials. So, so it was an HR director. They all, they all wanted swords. <laughs> Uh, it was an HR director job that I went for and we're I'm doing the interview and the lady's older than me quite a bit. Uh, can you say that in HR? I'm not, I'm not working for them so they can kiss my butt, but I, we're having this interview and like halfway through it, they all of a sudden are like, time out. We got to have a Nerf gun war and they just start going after it. I'm like, I, I, I mean, this is cool that y'all want to have fun, but I'm <laughs> I'm going for a serious interview here, and now I'm screwed because I'm dressed in a suit, and y'all are ready to jump over furniture. What the crap? So you let those old ladies beat you in a Nerf gun war? Well, no, it was. It, it <laughs> that was is what I heard. <laughs> the what? rest were all millennials, like just out of high school, it seemed like. Dude, I would have slayed those kids, ripped my pants, get the job or not, just to prove a point. <laughs> Try to impromptu <laughs> Nerf gun war on me. You're going down, Bubba. I want to see you jump in with your samurai sword. Yes. It's like, I brought a real gun. What's up? No. <laughs> he didn't get the job, but he got a record that. by the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Office <I> pop. <laughs> like about Nerf gun wars and stuff. I mean, that's not what we're talking about in terms of leadership. Like, so it's not, I know we're talking about, well. That was like the lazy affair. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what I'm trying to, what I'd love to, to highlight is that it's not a lot of work, I think, to just care about your employees and to ensure that they feel good about the work they're doing and that they're not going to quit tomorrow. And I know a ton of employees that are in those authoritarian type of work environments. They don't think there's anything else. <clears throat> they're okay with it. They do it. And if they get a better offer, they're probably going to quit. And it's, it's like a good leader, despite them being okay with the authoritarian dictatorship of whatever their work department is, understands that, hey, they probably shouldn't be working at 11 o'clock at night because they have a newborn and maybe I shouldn't message them right now. And so those are the components of work. I don't think it is too touchy-feely. I think it's just, again, being aware of the people that work under you and they may still want to do the work, but what are the boundaries that they do work under? What are the expectations of them? because this type of leadership is more impactful for the leaders that don't think there are boundaries. And that is a lot of times the case. It's not in like, I think the normal every day, we're friends, but not friends. You know, we don't really have issues with turnover. No, like we, there are some, some big concerns out there with some organizations. See, you, you keep going back to the, the humanity side and I really think that's affiliative. Right? That's just like Oprah. She falls right in that category. So is, is that I a think style? you have a management style. You're just not wanting to admit it. I don't give everybody free cars. Yeah. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up because I'm um, I appreciate Ben for being polite and hanging in there with us. Um I want to tell a story and then I'll share my opinion. I had an employee that to use her terms, she felt like a black sheep. She did not communicate well with others. She was pretty rough and kind of like, 
the rest of the group was not her biggest fan, I guess. She just kind of wanted to keep to him herself. And, um, but she was by far like extremely smart. She had trouble uh, being motivated, I guess, to some degree and uh was pretty outspoken so uh being my first like management role for real that was kind of hard to manage of like being fair to everyone else but also getting the most out of this asset so um i'm gonna try to put words into ben's mouth here and say we can call Ben style, touchy feely, like you silly millennial, you know, work too hard. Or we can just say, what would, how would we get the best ROI as a leader, right? If you're a manager, how am I going to get the best out of my employees? And if I'm a manager, I can invest zero. And if I get out like a neutral thing, then guess what? Zero effort in and not much out. It's fine. We're equal at least. But what I found was that when you make someone feel like they're important and so some people don't even know what they're good at, like you have to tell them like, you're really good at this. And they're like, really? And it's like, yes, look at what you've done and then provide some evidence. And they're like, holy cow, I'm like actually good at this. And, and my boss noticed, and I'm like, can you just do that more? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, totally. It's so easy for me. And I'm like, well, it's not easy for everybody. This is your gift. And so in Alton land, I believe that God put a gift in every one of us. And I've said that before. Some of us have many gifts I've heard. And <laughs> I think it's a leader's job to find that out, identify it and inspire the people to use it and that's where they're going to be the most happiest because a boss you know like if you're at mcdonald's maybe you're looking over the mcdonald's burger flipper every second right but ben's talking about these execs and these upper level managers you can't be there all the time that's why you have somebody underneath you so how do you inspire them to give their best when you're not there and that's identifying the gift that they have and incentivizing that. So back to leadership styles, I don't have a leadership style because I'm not like you smart like you guys. But what I'm saying is that you have to, you have to connect with people if you want to get the most out of them. And my opinion is that it doesn't matter if if you make that connection with that person, then you're going to find out sooner or later if they're good at that job or not. And if you make that connection, it's even better. So that person that I, that I talked about, that was kind of hard to, to manage, like it's been 10 years since we worked together and she sent me a message like not too long ago. And she was like, man, you were the best boss ever. Like, like I still hear some of the things that you said. I don't even remember what she said, but it was basically like years later, she's like, man, you were awesome. Thanks. And I'm like, I don't know where that came from, but um, that's my opinion is that if you put people first, then that's going to come back and that that's the best investment you can make. But, but most of what you just said was all coaching related. You're coaching them to, to be what they are best at. Yeah. You threw in the affiliative like, like him. But it seems like you're more of the coaching style. Is that what you would say? <laughs> you're asking, like, I don't know. It's like asking you to explain a jujitsu move that you don't know. I'm not educated <laughs> in, like, the styles. I just told you what I think. Though. You're, you're just dictatorship when it comes to jujitsu, aren't you? Tap, do it now. Tap, tap. Yeah. If only it were that easy. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, ben, so you do speaking gigs. You also do consulting. Are you living in Austin right now? Yeah, I am in Austin, and I was going back and forth from Chicago a little bit, but the winter months are now upon us. I'm pretty sure I'll be in Austin <laughs> for now for, for a while. 
Man, you should. We should have just recorded this at uh at Alton's place, or at I mean our studio, not Alton's place. The studio. Yeah, Alton's place is the name of the studio, isn't it? That's right. Hey, man. <laughs> I think I saw it on Google Maps. Six there's Street. Another, That's where it's uh, located. There's another business for me. I can just open up my my hot box here for a recording studio. <laughs> Sell podcast time. So, so Ben, if people want to reach out to you and discuss this more, learn. Uh, other tricks in their career path how can they do that well just like every other millennial you take um, all your passions and values write them on a piece of paper and tuck them under your pillow at night yes go to the mirror and say my name three times (laughs) and i like you (laughs) um so you can reach out to me on linkedin i respond to every message dr benjamin ritter you can check out some free media content on YouTube. Again, just Dr. Benjamin Ritter. And check out my website at liveforyourselfconsulting.com. Nice. Well, I'm Dr. John Herzog, and next week's <laughs> Dr. Alton Hill as of 7 p.m. tonight. Dot so, beard. Dot beard. Dot beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, no, it, it was fun, Ben. I appreciate you screwing up my whole podcast when I prepared everything nice and neat and you screwed me over. But, you know, hey. No, we really kidding. appreciate that. It was ben. good. You're awesome. Thanks for being a, a trooper. Yeah, Elton yeah. and Barb and I planned this, so. <laughs> he probably did. He probably called you when he found out you lived in Austin. Um, but But we'll definitely have to meet up, especially since you're local here. Um, we are south of the border, so. You'll have to drive on down. But if you are still listening in, make sure to catch our next show. They always air Monday at 6 a.m. Our Deciding Factor Extras are Thursdays at 6 a.m. And we appreciate everything that you want to say about our podcast, whether they're bad or good. It gives us something to work with. But make sure you send Barb a special private message. She will. Yeah, post all those Do nasty those comments. Just- I like to read them. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. It was fun. Hope you learned something. And everyone, say bye. Bye. Adios. Bye. This has been another episode of The Deciding Factor. Giving you food for thought on real life issues. Be sure to click, like, and subscribe to this podcast as well as all your big social media outlets, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't forget to check out our website at thedecidingfactorpodcast.com and give us comments and feedback. Until next time, stay safe and remember to keep an open mind.